on the topic of difficult topics, let's talk about the talk this morning. Nobody loves to have the talk. In fact, we hate having the talk so much, I don't even have to tell you what the talk is. You automatically know and have a perception in your mind of what the talk is, because it's uncomfortable, it's awkward, right? Nobody wants to have it. Kids in the room, you dreaded your parents having the talk with you. You try to avoid it, you run, you hide. I mean, you could even lock yourself in the closet. Doesn't matter. Your parents are gonna find you and they're gonna talk to you about it and it's gonna be awkward. But can I be honest with you? If you think it's awkward for you, your parents don't wanna have that conversation any more than you do. Because parents in the room, you know that having the talk with your kids is just as, if not more uncomfortable than them having to listen to it. Because you sit down and you try and strategize and think about ways you can make it a little less cringy and awkward, but you know that's not gonna happen. It's gonna be a little weird. It's gonna be a little uncomfortable. And so you just have to prepare yourself like a soldier going off into a war of uncomfortability. Nobody likes to have the talk. But we understand that things like the talk are necessary for us to grow up, to have wisdom and how to navigate difficult situations in life and grow in maturity. Well, we're wrapping up our series today, Money Matters. And what we've been doing is taking the past couple of weeks to talk about some wise biblical principles on how we can handle our money. And over the past couple of weeks, we talked about this using these buckets as the example for what this looks like. Because the reality is, is that our finances, if we boil them down, are really simple, right? We have income and our income is usually a paycheck or something along those lines. And then what we do is we do one of three things with it. We either spend it, save it, or give it. And so what this looks like is the vast majority of this money for most of you is gonna go into the spend bucket. And so these are things like rent and debt and car notes and living expenses and entertainment and anything else you'd like to do. And then what we do from there is we take a portion of what we have and maybe you save it, right? And so that saving could be things like a 401k or something along those lines. Or maybe you're somebody that keeps an emergency fund or some weird stash of money under your mattress. Yes, we know about it. We prayed it for you. And then if we have a little bit left, we'll take that little bit and we'll drop it in the giving bucket. And so this is kind of, in a nutshell, what our finances look like. And so the first two weeks of this series, Nathan gave us some great wisdom and practical examples of what it looks like to wisely spend and save our money. And so if you didn't catch those sermons, they're really important to understanding the kind of whole big picture we're giving you guys. And so I'd encourage you to go back and watch them. They're on our YouTube page and on our website. You can find them there. But today, what I want to close out with is talking to you about giving. Now, if we're really honest with ourselves, this is the topic that more than any of you probably dread the most. Because if we're really honest with ourselves, we kind of treat the topic of giving like the talk, right? We know that it's a part of our faith. We know that it's an essential part of a growing relationship with God, but we don't like to talk about it. And so if you were honest with me, the majority of you would probably go, I don't want to talk about that today. And if I'm being honest with you and the church staff was honest with you, the reality is we don't really love talking about it all the time either because we know it's uncomfortable. We know it makes you awkward and we know that you would rather listen to us talk about any other topic and area of obedience in your faith in the same way that when you were a kid, you wished your parents would just ask you about your day instead of talking about all the special changes in your life. But here's the deal. In the same way that the talk is necessary for kids and parents to have, Talking about giving and generosity is important for us to talk about in the church. And so if we're going to be the church that we're really called to be, and we're going to have conversations like this, we're going to talk about difficult topics like generosity and giving because we want you to grow into the fullness of Christ in all areas of your life, including finances. And so today, I want to have the talk about giving with you. And so what you can do, if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can open those up to 2 Corinthians 9. And I want to talk to you today about three truths about giving and the heart behind it and how that applies to us. So uh, we're going to start by looking at verse six this morning. And it says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. 
Now, Paul uses this letter, so this is a letter written to the church in Corinth, it's one of two, and he uses this section to talk to them about giving that they have promised him. They promised to support him financially, and so he uses a majority of this chapter to kind of talk to them about the impact that giving has in their lives and the heart behind it. And so he opens up this talk with a combination of different Proverbs found in the Old Testament. And ultimately, what he's saying here is that generosity leaves a lasting impact in our lives and in our relationship with God. And that was an important truth for the Corinthians to remember, but it's also an important truth for us to focus on today as we talk about the heart behind giving. But if we're gonna understand the importance of this verse, we really need to understand the difference between the Old Testament tithe and New Testament giving. So commanded in Deuteronomy 14, the Old Testament tithe was a portion or specifically 10% of the income or first fruits of livestock and crops, and that would be set aside for godly purposes. Now the tithe served different purposes depending on the year. So within the first two years of the tithe, it served two purposes. First, it would support the Levites, which were the, the priestly tribe. They did not have land or inheritance. And so their money, their support came strictly from the tithe. But you would also use the tithe would, would be used to purchase food for religious festivals that were required in Judaism. And then every third year, the tithe specifically was set aside to help the poor. Now, you did different things with the tithe as well throughout these years. So in the first two years, you would take the tithe to the presence of God. So early in the New Testament, this is our Old Testament, this is the tabernacle. And later in the Old Testament, it's the temple when it's built. And then on the third year, you would not take your tithe to the temple, but instead you would actually hold on to it and store it in your towns. And when traveling with the tithe, it was actually, if you could not travel with it, you could take it and convert it into silver and then take that silver when you got to the temple and purchase new livestock and crops to give up. So you can tell by listening to this that the tithe is not just some mindless giving of resources to God. It's an intentionally thought out and well-established sacrificial process that God set up and it served very specific purposes, right? It took care of people and helped support the mission of God's kingdom. But it was also an act of worship. So the tithe was not just a giving of your resources, but when you would travel to the temple with your tithe, you would actually take a portion of it and you would eat it as a meal. It would be consumed in the presence of God with rejoicing as an act of worship. And so the tithe, as we talk about this, is characterized by a specific set of requirements that all set to serve a specific purpose in the context of Judaism. It's rules and requirements and regulations established through Levitical law and Deuteronomic code that applied to the people of Israel. But New Testament giving is a little different. Right? New Testament giving still serves the same purpose. It still supports the mission of the church and the mission of God's people and to help those in need, but we're no longer under the legalistic requirements of the tithe. See, when Jesus established a new covenant through his death and resurrection in the cross, right, it nullified all of the requirements of Judaic law for us. And so what that means is that ultimately we're not really under the tithe. But it's important to understand that Jesus did not simply remove the law, but rather fulfill it. Look at what he says in Matthew 5, 17. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. So Jesus' life, death, and resurrection did not serve to remove the law, but rather Jesus perfected the law. That in his life, he met the requirements and the standards of the law through his perfect living. And he took the place of every sacrifice, including the tithe, as a result of his sacrifice for us. Right? That Jesus demonstrated the ultimate act of generosity by giving himself for us as a sacrifice that we could have a restored relationship with God. And so because of that, when Jesus said his words, it is finished on the cross, his resurrection, man, that seals his authority. And so when he said it's finished, he means it. And so what that means for us as followers of Christ is that by all definition, we are no longer under the biblical Old Testament command to tithe because we don't live under Judaic law. Now, some of you are hearing that and you're like, all right, pastor, like that's what I wanted to hear today. I'm going to go take my money out of that give bucket. I'm going to put it right back in that spin bucket and I'll be on my way. But I want you to hear what I'm saying when I say this. Are we technically no longer under the Old Testament command to tithe? Yes. 
But generosity is still an important part of our relationship with God. And if we're honest, probably even way more important now that we live under grace and not under the law. Look at what happens in the next verse. This is verse 7. Paul says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So Paul speaks here to the difference between the Old Testament tither and the New Testament giver. And the distinction that he makes here, this difference, leads us to our first truth this morning, is that giving comes from the heart not the law. And this distinction changes everything about how we think about giving because giving is no longer about following a rule. It's not doing it because we have to, but giving now becomes a response that we give because of the generosity and blessing that God has shown us first. We give because of what he has done for us. Now that doesn't mean that giving and generosity aren't important. Generosity isn't just a suggestion as followers of Christ. Generosity should be the result of our heart change as we come to a relationship with Jesus. And so Paul talks about this not as a suggestion, but that this is what our life becomes. And I love that he uses some specific wording here when he talks about these words in verse seven. He says that we would give what we have decided to give. Note that he doesn't say, if we decide to give but what we decide to give. And that distinction right there shows us a little bit of the heart behind giving. Giving is not about a suggestion. It's not about rule following. It's the result of our heart change as we grow to look more like Jesus. That when Paul talks about in Romans 12, that our minds and our hearts are transformed and renewed every single day, that as we grow to look more and more like Jesus, Generosity is the natural result, that giving is about the heart. Over the past few weeks, we talked about the truth that every financial decision is a spiritual decision. And Jesus talked about this more than anyone else, right? This was the most popular topic to Jesus, that he talked about money more than anything else outside of the kingdom of God. And the reason he did this is that Jesus knew that how we handled our money mattered in our relationship with God. In fact, Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 24. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so Jesus makes it pretty clear here that Mosaic law or not, God cares about our finances. God cares about what we do with our money, that every financial decision is a spiritual decision. And so what Jesus is saying here, the point that he's making is that if we think that the way we handle our money does not have to do with our hearts, we're wrong. Generosity has everything to do with our hearts and not rule following. It serves as a litmus test first to see where our priorities lie. But Paul even says that it goes beyond that, that you can tell it's from the heart because as we grow in generosity, we grow in relationship with God. In verse six, Paul uses the Greek word when he talks about giving generously and sowing generously. And it's best translated in this idea of sowing blessings. And, and so what Paul is saying here is that as we sow blessings on God's kingdom and God's people, then God in return sows blessings on us. Now, that is not a promise that God makes us rich when we give, but Paul's point is that God blesses our lives and grows us. And so as we live out generosity and sacrificial giving, God provides for us, he helps sustain us, but he also helps us to grow in our relationship with God. That as we grow in obedience, we grow closer to God. And as we learn to depend on God when we give him control of our finances, we develop a trust in God that grows as we do that. And this is evident by the Greek word that he uses for the word cheerful giver. Cheerful giver is actually best translated as the idea of a joyous giver. That as we sacrifice for God and as we live out generosity, Paul says not only do we develop a maturity in our relationship with God, but we also develop a joy. And so the idea of a cheerful giver is somebody that lives out this sacrifice and experiences the joy and the peace of God in every circumstance. See, giving, it comes from the heart. And as we grow in that, and as we give as a response to God, what Paul says happens is we grow in our relationship with him and we develop a new perspective in life, a perspective that's based on God's joy 
and God's peace. So don't look at giving as some blind rule following, but understand that it is the result of our heart change that a generous life, a sacrificial life, is the natural response to God's grace. But here's the deal. If we want God to bless us through our sacrificial giving, there has to be sacrifice. Look back on me at verses six through seven. He said, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, God's heart behind our giving has nothing to do with us following rules or really anything about us giving him money in particular. Because if we're serious about it, we understand God doesn't need our money. He's God. But what God wants is your heart. God wants to be the priority in your life above everything else, every aspect. He wants your focus, your attention, your worship, and your devotion in every aspect of your life, including your finances. And Paul talks about the idea of sowing generously and ties it to this concept of a cheerful giver. And his point here is that giving is not just this thing that we do because we have to, but rather that giving really is a sacrificial act of worship. And so this is going to lead us to our second truth today, is that giving should be mindful. If God doesn't care about your money, he's not interested if you give it with the wrong mindset behind it. And so Paul makes this clear. God's not interested in reluctant tithers and sorrowful givers. He wants cheerful givers that we would understand the sacrifice we're making and be able to rejoice in knowing that we're giving up something that we care about, something significant to us out of our love for God. That's what giving is. But to understand what it looks like to live sacrificially and give sacrificially, we need to talk a little bit about what a sacrifice really is. And so here's the deal. Giving should hurt. Now, I know that seems like a little bit of a backwards concept when Paul talks about a cheerful giver. But think about this for a second. What sacrifice doesn't hurt? When you think about the concept of a sacrifice in the Old Testament, it involves the killing of an animal. And so not only is there a death of a living being, but you're actually giving up a portion of your wealth. Your animals were your wealth. And so every sacrifice was marked with the loss of something significant to you. So if our sacrifice does not cost us something great, it's not much of a sacrifice. See, giving, the goal behind a sacrifice is that we have to recognize it should cost us something great that the way we give should be so substantial to us that it matters. We see an example of this in Mark 12, 41 through 44. This is Jesus and the widow. Jesus sat down opposite to the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. And many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. And calling his disciples to him, he said, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. <clears throat> so as Jesus is sitting in this temple, he's observing what's happening here, right? He sees the widow and he sees the rich people. And what we notice right off the bat is the widow gives two mites. Now, if you don't know what a mite is, it was a very, very small amount of currency. This is a tiny, measly amount of money compared to the ridiculous amount of money that these rich people were giving. But Jesus, when observing between the two groups, he says that the widow's offering was far greater than any of the rich people's offerings. Why? Why? Because Jesus looked at how they gave, not what they gave. See, for the rich people, the reality is their giving didn't really seem to be much of a concern to them, did it? 
right? It may have been more than what the tithe was commanded. We don't really know. It says that they gave out of their wealth, but we know that what they do is they toss their giving into the temple and then they just leave as if it's about their day. But the widow, she puts in two mites and Jesus says that's all she has to live on, 100%. So if you're good with numbers, you know 100% means everything. Everyone else gives simply to give. But this widow gives something substantial to her. That two mites might not have seemed like much in the plate, but it cost her everything. And see, that's the example that Jesus gives us for generosity. And his point is not that we give 100%. That's not what Jesus is saying in here. His point is that our giving has to be a true and substantial sacrifice to us. But here's the deal. What a sacrifice is, is going to be different for every single one of you. And you're gonna have to figure out what that is. But the point that Jesus is making here is that giving has to be a sacrifice, that it has to cost something to you. And what I love about the example that the widow sets here is that she gives everything. She doesn't care about what it is. Out of her love for God, she gave everything she had for him. Because the reality is, Jesus isn't calling us to easy giving. Jesus wants to be the priority of our lives. He wants to be at the top of your life in every aspect. And so when we look at the widow, we see this picture-perfect example of giving everything out of her love for God. You know, when I decided that I wanted to marry my wife, Hannah, it was long into our relationship. I would say, if I had to put a number on it, like five or six minutes. Uh, I, I joke about that, but as cheesy as it sounds, I knew right from the get-go, I was like, I'm marrying this woman, I'm locking her down. Like, it's gonna happen. Only problem with that was, I was a 23-year-old dude, I didn't have any money, and I had to come up with a ring. Now, I was blessed that I was given a diamond to put into a ring, but I still had to come up with money for the ring itself and pay someone, a jeweler preferably, to actually put that diamond in the ring so I had something that was really nice to give to my wife. And so I struggled with what to do about how to come up with the money, and I had this idea in my head that I had a collection of some guitars, and I thought maybe I could sell one or two of my guitars and be able to fund the ring. And so after looking at my collection, I had one guitar in particular that was a guitar given to me by my dad. It was a 1996 Jackson Dinky. It was a valuable guitar, but more importantly than that, it held a lot of sentimental value to me. And I wrestled back and forth with what to do about this. I was like, I, I just, I don't know. This guitar means a lot to me, but I want to have a ring for Hannah. I really want to do this right. And so ultimately, I made the decision to sell that guitar to fund the ring for Hannah. And the reason I did that is I decided that as much as I cared about that guitar, I cared about Hannah way more. And so if selling that guitar is what got the ring I wanted to have for her, it was worth it. See, that's what sacrifice is. Sacrifice is giving up something you care about for something you care about even more. And this is what it means for us to sacrifice for God, that our love for God has to trump our care for money, right? My love for Hannah trumped my care for that guitar. And so I'll be honest with you guys, if I could go back and redo that decision a thousand different times, I would make the same choice every single time because it mattered to me that I took care of Hannah and I blessed her in this moment, right? I did not care about that guitar nearly as much as I care about my wife. And so the point that Jesus makes with the widow is that we have to love and care about God way more than we care about our finances. And that's not to say that our money isn't important. It's not to say that money isn't something we should care about. We understand that money is important. It's an important part of our lives. It's something we should care about. And we just spent two weeks talking about wise and biblical principles to take care of that. But what Jesus is saying is that if we truly love and honor and prioritize God in the way that we say we do, 
that he is at the top of our lives, that he is the one we worship, he is the one we are devoted to, and he is the one we sacrifice for, that sacrificial giving is the natural result. But in that sacrifice, we find joy in knowing that we're living out the same generosity that Jesus showed us. So today, I want to challenge you to wrestle with the question, what does sacrificial giving mean to you? Here's the deal. I don't have some prescribed amount for you to tell you that this number right here, if you get to this, this is sacrificial giving. You're going to have to think about that for yourself. And what I want to challenge you here is this is not talking about, oh, well, when I leave today, I'll drop a 20 in the box and I'll check it off my box. I'm good. But I really want you to think about this question. What does it mean and what would it look like for your life to be marked with sacrificial generosity? What would it look like for you to give sacrificially? Maybe for some of you, that means giving for the first time. Maybe it means that you give more than you currently do. Maybe it means that you're more consistent in your giving. Maybe it means that you continue to be faithful in giving sacrificially. But whatever it looks like, Jesus is calling us to sacrificial giving. He doesn't call us to easy giving. He calls us to honor and prioritize God with everything in our lives. And so sacrificial giving should be the result of that. Now, I'll tell you that if you're somebody who believes that you are giving sacrificially, I do have some things I want to challenge you with. I want to challenge you to remember that giving should be mindful. And so don't let giving become something that's just routine for you, that you check your box and do it every month and then don't think about it. But really to think through what it means for us to give sacrificially to God and to worship him in response to that. So if you're somebody who every single week you got your money, whether it's a check or an envelope, and you walk out that door, you slip it in the black box, I love that you do that. Take a second and think about what it means for you to give that up when you drop it in that box. And I would even encourage you to take a second as you do that to pray and thank God for the opportunity to give back to him in that moment. If you're somebody that gives online through recurring giving, I wanna challenge you not to let that be something that just happens in the background that you don't think about. Online recurring giving is an incredible thing. Can we just talk about how awesome technology is that we can set that stuff up and it automatically does it? And I think it's incredible that some of you do that because it shows it's a priority for you, right? In the same way that you pay your bills, you wanna be faithful in giving. And so you're like, I'm gonna make sure it happens when I want it, exactly how I want it, the way I want it done. It's good. But I would encourage you in that to constantly pray about that. Remember what it is you're doing. Remember the sacrifice, what you're making, what you're giving, and what that means for you. To giving, it's not meant to be something that we just do because we're Christians. Giving is a sacrificial act of worship. And it should force us to be mindful. Right? When we give sacrificially, that should put our focus and our attention and our devotion and our worship back to God as we give to the God who sacrificially gave for us first. And in that, there is joy in knowing that we're living out the design that God has for our lives. All right, look at me at our last verses this morning. These are verses eight through 11. It says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it's written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving and to God. So when we give with the right heart and motives, God honors our sacrifice. Earlier in verse six, Paul talked about the concept that when we sow generously, we reap generously. And in our verses here, he goes into a little bit more explanation about what this means. And the ultimate idea here is that when we give sacrificially to God, God blesses all areas of our life. And so this leads to our last truth this morning, that giving 
leaves a lasting impact. Now, we talked about this a good bit earlier in the first section of the sermon, but giving first leaves an impact in our lives, right? That there is a growth in our relationship that we develop when we give sacrificially to God. So when we make the choice to trust God with our finances and give him control of that, right, we are giving him all of that, and that means that we now have a dependence on God. And that dependence should lead to a closeness with God. And that closeness when nurtured with obedience, leads to a maturity that we develop in our faith. And so Paul says, again, that as we grow in our relationship with God through giving, right, as we live this out in obedience, that the end result is that we look more and more like Christ every single day. Now, the impact from giving is not just about the impact it has on us, but Paul also makes a point to say that giving impacts the people and the world around us. Now, it's important to understand that as Paul talks about this impact, he is talking about it in the context of the church. Remember that his audience is the church in Corinth. And so as he talks about the kind of impact we have in giving, he is speaking specifically to how they give to the church and how they give as the church. And here's why this is important. Giving individually and giving in the church are completely different. Right, giving as an individual, man, you can do some great things through that. But when we give as the church, and that has an impact that's so much bigger than anything possible, is how we give as individuals. And that's why we challenge you constantly at Karis City to give back to the church. But more specifically, it's why we challenge ourselves as a church to be generous back to God and to others. And there's ways that we constantly try to live this out. And specifically, we have two things we're doing right now to live out this kind of generosity as a church. Over the past couple of weeks, our community groups have been putting together blessing bags for the homeless. And so we've been getting supplies ready. And what we're going to do with those is most of them will go into the cars of the group members. And as we drive around the KDU scenario, we'll be able to bless homeless people with food and supplies. We're also taking a portion of those bags and we're donating them to our missions partner, Hope Impacts, so that they can bless people with those as well. And in addition to our regular giving towards missions, so we give to four missions partners here, Hope Impacts, Hearts for Heroes, Two Lives Changed, and Mustard Seed. We're also, we made the decision recently to give aid to those in North Carolina right now. And so what we've done is we've partnered with the church there, Nathan told you a little bit earlier, called Lake Hills Church in Candler, North Carolina, right outside of Asheville. And we've already given $2,000 out of our general giving fund to them so that they can be the church in their area and bless the people that need this and take care of those people that are devastated by Helene right now. And so we wanna challenge you to take up this, um, this call to generosity and sacrifice as well. And so we wanna encourage and challenge you to give in addition to your regular giving to Care City and help us in this effort to let this church do some great mission work there. And so there's ways you can do that for us, really simple. You can text the word give to that number or scan that QR code. They take you to the same place. If you've ever given online with us, there's a little drop down box that you can pick, general giving, benevolence, and hurricane relief. Just select hurricane relief for us so that we know that that's a specific donation for that church and we'll make sure that we get all those funds to them and we can kind of keep track of that. But here's the deal. The reason we think this is so important is that $2,000, if we're being honest, we could have come up with all kinds of reasons as to why we needed it. Right? We gotta pay staff, we gotta buy technology, we have to make all kinds of purchases all the time. And so it's really easy to go, guys, we don't have to give that money. Like, do you not see all the stuff we already do for missions? Like, we do an incredible job. Let's just not even worry about that. But that's not the church we're called to be. We don't wanna be a church that just talks to you about generosity. We wanna be the church that sets the example of what it looks like to give sacrificially. And we wanna challenge you to do the same thing with us as well. Last year, we gave just a little over 20% of our total giving went right back out the door to missions and benevolence. And we want to continue to be that generous church. Yeah, we can clap for that. That's the kind of generosity we want our church to have. And so we want to pattern that for you first and challenge you to join us in that mission of sacrificial giving. Now, some of you may be sitting here thinking like, Chris, That sounds great. I would love to do that, but here's the problem, right? I give to all these other great organizations. And so like, I just, I don't really have a lot of money to give to the church because like it all goes over here. And here's what I'll say to that. If you are somebody who gives to charitable organizations and good causes, there is nothing wrong with that. 
But we need to make a distinction and understand that giving to things like that is not the same as giving back to God. And so we need to be careful to make the distinction between giving to good things and giving to godly things. And so while it's good to give to good things, we need to make sure that we let the godly things in our life take priority, things like the church and mission work. And here's why this is important, right? Charitable giving absolutely does some good. Charitable giving changes people's circumstances, right? I, there are so many organizations out there that are doing absolutely incredible things. But giving is the church, and that can change someone's eternity. And that's a big difference. And we've gotten to see this kind of impact when we're generous as the church. If you've been here any length of time, you've seen several baptism videos recently, all throughout the summer, up through recently. We've had the privilege of baptizing 12 individuals with our missions partner, Hope Impacts, over the past few months. And yeah, we can clap for that. Because that's 12 people who didn't know Jesus, who now know Jesus. That's 12 people who didn't follow Jesus, who now follow Jesus. That's 12 eternities changed because of the generosity that we've played a part in through giving and serving. So we've been a church for a little over three and a half years. And in that time, and we have watched God do amazing, amazing things. I am blown away constantly by the impact our little church has. But here's what I think is powerful about this. I think God's just getting started. And I believe that if we will be generous as a church at Karis City, that we will have a bigger impact than we ever thought possible. That we would be blown away by what God will do in us and through us if we are generous and sacrificial with him. But here's the deal. It's not a singular effort. It's not about 20% of our church supporting 100% of our church. It's that every single one of us would answer the call to live and give sacrificially back to God. And if we will do that, it'll change everything for us. You know, in the 1900s, there was a small church in the town of Marinci, Arizona. They were a little bitty poor church and they, they operated in a little bitty poor copper mining town. And one week the church's roof had gotten damaged by a storm. And so the pastor gets up on stage that Sunday and he's like, hey, we've got to replace the whole roof and it's going to cost us $250. Now, some of you were like, I wish it cost $250 to replace my roof. Back then that was a lot of money. And again, we're talking about a poor, a poor copper mining town. So they don't have a lot of money anyway. And so the pastor asked people to pray about it and then you know, they would take up an offering the next week. Well, there was a widow in the church by the name of Ira Hicks. Now, Ira, she was poor. Like if you think about the definition of poor, she's it. She could barely make ends meet and what she would do is she would do laundry for people in the town and that would be just enough money for her and her son to eat. Well, the following Sunday, she shows up to church and she hands the pastor an envelope. And in that envelope was $250. Now the pastor, initially he's shocked and then he's reluctant. He's like, I cannot take this. I know you need this. I know your circumstances. But Ira was insistent. She's like, you have to take this. Listen, I've prayed about it and I believe that God is calling me to give this to you. So the pastor accepts the envelope and then he's curious. He's like, look, where did you, where did you get this money from? Well, when her late husband passed away, he left her his gold watch. And that gold watch was his most prized possession and it was the only valuable thing that Ira owned. And after praying about it, she felt that God was calling her to sell it and use the money to fix the church roof. And when the pastor asked her why she would do that, she said, I decided that as much as that watch meant to me, God's house was more important. And what I think is so cool is that Ira's example of sacrificial giving didn't just impact her church. Like, yes, in that moment, they got the money, they got to fix the roof, but because it was a small town and a small church, the people in her church heard about what she did and it impacted their lives. Their church started giving more generously. All the people in their church did. 
And when that happened, they started realizing they had an even bigger impact in their community. And the church started growing and growing and growing. And within a year of Ira giving that money, the church had raised so much money, they built an entirely new church building to house all of the new members. See, that's the kind of impact giving has. It changes us. It changes the people around us. It changes the world. And so what I believe is that if we'll be generous as a church, I believe it'll change everything for us. It'll change you. It'll change this city. It'll change this nation. And it'll change the world. The call on our lives is generosity. And so the challenge for you this morning is to give sacrificially. Let your life be marked with generosity and watch God bless our efforts through that. Let's pray.